I want to share a short word with you I'm calling Living Fully Alive. Living Fully Alive. Go with me. Let's start in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, famous section of Scripture. Uh, we like to call the Sermon on the Mount, the first part, um, the Beatitudes, and then it uh, continues. I'm just going to start there. It says, now when he saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began teaching them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the beginning of the famous message he shared we call the Sermon on the Mount. And um, going on to verse 17, he says this, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished or everything is fulfilled. Anyone who breaks one of these least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Father God, in the name of Jesus, uh, unveil the truth of your word by your spirit. Teach us and guide us in Jesus' name. That was a difficult saying when he said that, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, it says you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, here we have the standard of righteousness. What he's showing is the law of God and all his commandments of the Old Testament that he said would never be abolished until they're fulfilled. And then the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were the ones known at the time who understood it better than anyone else. And they were keeping not only the laws the best they could, but then all their own interpretations and versions of it themselves. So they appeared to be righteous following the law by everybody was looking at them. And now Jesus comes, this new rabbi comes in town who has the authority to preach and teach. People are seeing the miracles he's doing. And he's saying, you have heard it said like this from your rabbi, but I tell you, this is what it really means. This is the way the rabbis taught. The rabbis taught maybe there was a new rabbi, and they all agreed and believed in the Torah and the law, but they all had a little twist of how they interpreted it. And when the new rabbi came, Jesus Christ comes in, and he's, they recognize his authority by what he's done and, and what he said. Now they're saying, look, he's saying this is what the law really means, and he brings it even to a higher standard. So he's saying, unless your righteousness exceeds... The law, the Pharisees, and the, you have no way that you can enter. The, everybody's no way to enter the kingdom. Man, those guys keep the law better than any of us that we know. How can we enter? Wow. So he's say, saying that none of this will be done away with till it's fulfilled. But I'm telling you, the only one who's ever kept it, the only one who's ever obeyed it, the only one who was able to follow all of it was the one who created it all and now he's standing before him and his name is Jesus. Jesus, God in the flesh, it's God's law. It's his standards of righteousness. 
and none of mankind, not the Pharisees or the scribes who wore the long robes who looked like on the outwardly they were keeping it. Jesus is saying, unless your righteousness is more than them, you cannot enter. Another way he was saying, as it is, no one can enter. No one can enter. All have sinned and fallen short of the righteousness, the righteous requirements of the law. And Jesus even interpreted it to a higher level where the law was talking about the outward signs of the sin, but Jesus took it a degree further and showed it was the spirit of the law saying, hey, you've heard it said do not murder. I'm telling you, don't hold anger against your brother. You've heard it said don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, don't lust in your heart. You've heard it said, don't swear by this or make a pledge or an oath by the temple or this. I'm saying, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. So he was taking the law as strict and it seemed to be impossible for man to follow. And it was because of our nature was sinful and we couldn't keep it. Even the most religious of the day, he said they didn't make it. He was taking that law and he was bringing it even higher where it's not just the outward signs of doing it, it's the heart of the matter. And now he basically puts everyone in the same boat short of making it. But praise God, the good news is he made it. He created the law. He came as one of us, as a man, and he fulfilled all of it. And then he abolished it. He fulfilled all of the law. He came not from the seed of Adam, not from the fallen nature of man, but he was born of a virgin. The seed and the word of God became flesh and walked among us. So while the temptation came from all over, the same temptation that tempted Adam in the garden, tempted Jesus in the wilderness, the same devil, but he didn't have the nature to yield to it. He had the very nature of who he is, of God himself. And he walked and he defeated the enemy and he lived the perfect life. So he's saying here in the Sermon on the Mount, you'll be blessed to be able to follow and have this, but he's talking about a change of heart. So he gives us the, the answer here. I want you to turn with me now from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Go with me to Galatians 2, a verse of Scripture we've been mentioning a lot lately. Galatians chapter 2, here's the answer. Jesus fulfilled all of the righteous requirements of the law with his life. And then, praise the Lord, he also fulfilled the curse of the law with his death. We couldn't obey it, so he did. We deserve to die as a result of punishment for the law, and he took that too. He fulfilled both sides of the law. The righteous requirements and the punishment. He did it all for us. He did everything, praise the Lord. So here's the answer. How can we now live righteous requirements of God? How do we live it out where there's only one way? There's only one who did. It's Jesus who did it. And he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19, For through the law I have died to the law so that I might live for God. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Do you get it? He's the only one that could fill all the righteous requirements of the law. He's the only one who did. No man could. So he died in the place of all man. And then with him, our sin nature was put in him and buried and killed with him and died. And now when he resurrected, we were resurrected a new creation. And now it's not you that live. It's not I that live. Now we can keep the law. We can fulfill the spirit of the righteousness of the law. Why? Because it's not you doing doing it it's Christ who lives in you so all of the old world of the old covenant of the old testament of all the people before Christ 
No one could keep it. Jesus did. But now the righteousness of God is being revealed to the world because the righteousness of God now lives in you and you are demonstrating to the people. You are demonstrating to your family, to your friends now with Christ in you. This is what it looks like to live with God, walk with God, talk with God, in right relationship with God because it's not really me doing it. It's Christ who lives in me. I have died and my life is no longer my my own it's Christ in me who's now living hallelujah man it's so good here have some I want to give it to you just have some the life of God is powerful it overflows out of us and see people come out of darkness and get touched with the light and their life is transformed why because what I'm talking about is supernatural power of the living God living in me flowing out of my mouth and touching you right now Amen. this is not just some religious motions we're going through. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the living God, living in the people of God. And now the righteousness of God is walking around the earth today. Don't you know the Bible says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? <laughs> Maybe our guests here today are a little shocked. You can drive back next Sunday and get some more. <laughs> we, don't, we don't teach and preach Christians are sinners and filthy, rotten, and dragging through this life, barely going to make it. No, we teach the risen Christ raised you from the dead. And now it's not really you that's alive, it's him living in you. And folks, if we can get this across to renew your mind to the truth of it, and you can feel it and believe it and live it every day, you'll understand that my hands and my feet and my mouth and my eyes and my body is not belong to me. I've died, and now I've been resurrected, and Christ lives in me. That's who we are. Why do people live short of the glory, short of the victory? Because they don't know this word. People perish for lack of knowledge, not really understanding who you are in Christ. You're thinking of yourself as who you were from your parents or who you were from your tribe or who you were from your culture or who you were from your race or who you were from how you were raised or what religion you were raised in. You think of yourself according to the world and God said you have died and been buried and you no longer live. How can you continue to do drugs when the drug addict in you is dead? You'll never have a problem again if you just believe this truth of who you are and quit letting the devil lie to you of who you were. How do we get there? How do we live this full life? Well, I've been teaching a series on it for the last several weeks. I'm going to review. Number one, we must believe by faith that His blood... God provided for the remission of our sin. So we have forgiveness and pardon from our sins in the past, any sins in the present, and whatever stumble we might have sins in the future have already been remitted by the blood of Jesus Christ. One. Two. We must also believe as much as we can accept the blood has given us forgiveness, we must also accept that His death has delivered us from the sin nature. If you're a guest here today, that's what a lot of Christians don't get. We can believe in the blood that He's washed our sins, but we have trouble believing that His death crucified and killed our old nature. And when He died, you died with Him. That's scriptural, that's word. It's hard to fathom with our natural mind, but I'm talking about a, this is supernatural. It's beyond human scope of self-help, of getting yourself right, of quitting a bunch of old and trying to form new habits. No, it's about the old is dead and the new becomes life and the new because it's Christ in you. That's why it's new, because it's not you anymore. It's Christ in you. Hey Amen. I get a couple of, this is good preaching, man. It's all through, it's in the word. Hallelujah. It's not my message. It's the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. 
So by his blood, you have forgiveness. By his death, you've been delivered from the sinful nature. The cross last week we showed is the great divide. His burial. So by his burial, everything from the old life, everything from the old realm, everything from Adam to Jesus, everything of the old world has been drowned. Just like... Noah's flood is a picture of what baptism is today. Everything was flooded and they walked out to a brand new world. Man, when you were baptized, everything of your past was drowned and gone forever. And you woke up to a brand new world with a brand new spirit. That's a, keep that picture in you right now. Dwell on it. Write it down if you need to. Put it on your forehead and look in the mirror if you have to. Whatever it takes. Just write it backwards so you can look in the mirror you can see. <laughs> Praise the Lord. By His blood, we have remission. By His death, we've been delivered from our old nature. By the great divide. By His burial, everything in the past was drowned. By His resurrection, we have the newness of life. Everything in that cross, burial, by his resurrection, we have the new life. And it's no longer yours, people, Christians. It's not your life given back to you after you come through a rehab. And now you go back to your life without drugs. If that's what you think, you've missed it. Amen. It's your life has been has been killed, crucified, died, and buried. And now the life you have is not your own, and it's not for you to make the decisions of what to do with it. You don't get to make the decisions of how you're going to live or what you're going to do. Your life is not your own. It's been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And you must follow Him. He purchased your life. He owns it. You've got to recognize that. I was telling the graduates today, you leave here today and go back home and don't get plugged into a Bible-believing, Spirit-led church, then you are arrogant. And, ha, God, I got off of drugs now. You freed me while I'm fresh start, but now I don't need you. I don't need your word. I don't need your church. I'm just going to, hey, I'm going to choose my own way like Adam did from the knowledge of my own good and evil, how to live and what to do and how to think and where to go. No, my, I'm taking my life back and I'm going to do it my way. Those of you who don't get in a Bible-believing, spirit-led church, I don't care if your parents don't go or they go to some dead religion. Get out of there and get to where you can hear the word and be fed or you will die. You have to continue. If you don't go, you're acting arrogantly. Shaking. And those of you visiting here that aren't in church, you also shaking your fists at God. I don't need you or your body or your preacher telling us what to do. I can do it on my own. I'm going to go my own way. That is an arrogant way to live. It's an arrogant and self-righteous way to live. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. By his resurrection, we have a new life. The only begotten son of God is now the first begotten of many sons and daughters. What I couldn't do, my hero, my big brother did for me. Not only he did, the, did he live the righteous life, but when I messed up and we all messed up, he took the punishment of his father and was whipped and died and buried for it. I failed. And he took the punishment. He lived the blessed life, and I get the blessing. What a deal, man. How come we got people in the world rejecting it? They don't want to come. They don't want to hear. They don't want to open their word. They don't want to listen to somebody preach, teach. They don't want to turn it on the TV, the radio. They're just shaking their arrogant fist. No, God, I may believe you created it, but I will not follow you. I will not humble myself and get in the church. I know better than them. Dear God. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Now, 
the righteousness of the law has been fulfilled in Him. Now it's revealed in us a higher standard than the old law. It's gone higher than that. Now it's the love of God. All the law is fulfilled in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor so much you'll take in the drug addict. You'll visit the, the, the poor. You'll visit the prison. You'll reach out to the lost. You'll help. Love your neighbor. Do unto them as you'd have them do. Whatever you do for the least of your brother, that's what we've done unto you. So we demonstrate the righteous requirements by loving our neighbor and having it being fulfilled as we give it to others. Man, get involved in a Bible-believing, spirit-led church that's reaching some folks. You go into a church that has a few old folks that are dying and nobody's doing anything reaching young people, get out of there and find one that's reaching out to some folks that's doing something for the kingdom. God is a good God, and he's going to be reaching people wherever he's at. Hallelujah. Now, praise God. We get there, folks, by this living fully alive, one by knowing the facts of our faith. I've already mentioned we know about the blood. We know his death delivered us. We know the crosses that divide and the, the burial washed everything. We know by his resurrection we have newness of life. But not only knowing it, then we must reckon it. Reckon ye yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. Reckon it isn't some country slang for kind of think of it that way. I'm not talking about I reckon it to be so. I'm talking about a reckoning, meaning an accounting term, where because it's a fact, you can put it in the bank and account for it. I'm talking it because it's a fact. Now you reckon it. You put it in your account, and you recognize, I have this. I have eternal life. My sins are washed. I have died to sin. I am alive, and I consider it mine. It's in my account. When God looks at me, this is what he sees. I am not who I used to be. I am. I believe it, and now I can reckon it. So I know it, and then I reckon it, and now the last step in closing. If I believe this and I know it and I can reckon it to my account, I can account it as so and speak it with faith. The last step, praise God, Romans chapter 6. And I'm going to close with this. Romans 6, verse 13. Let me back up just a little bit. We'll start in verse 11, guys. Go to back to verse 11 on that screen. In the same way, count yourself or reckon yourself Dead to sin, but alive to God. He wants you to know it, and he wants you to account it as so. And continue thinking this way for the rest of your life. I'm dead to sin and alive to God. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you obey its evil desires. Verse 13, do not offer. Everybody say offer. The King James says present. Do not present the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness. Well, they don't belong to you. They've been purchased with the blood of Christ. It's not yours to do with. Your body, your parts, your gifts, your talents, your construction work, your intellect, your business sense, everything is no longer yours. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Consider yourself as his and not your own. It'll cause you to live differently every single day. Do not offer yourself or present yourself to sin as instruments as, as wickedness, but rather offer yourself or present yourself as those who have been brought from death to life. You see that? Put the King James Version up for just a second. It says it this way. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield yourself unto God as those who are alive from the dead. He wants you to think of the way, the same way I'm telling you now, that you have died and now you're reborn alive from the dead. So now we present ourselves to God as, hey, you're the one. You did away with my sinful nature. You did away with my addiction. You've given me a new life in Christ. So I now present myself and offer my instruments, my hands, my feet, my mouth, my mind, my business, my money, everything I have. Lord, I offer it to you as an instrument of righteousness and no longer of wickedness. Amen. Do you think that would be reasonable? 
in light of what Christ has done for you, is it be, would it be reasonable that you consider yourself dead and now you're reborn in Him? So if you're reborn in Him, that your body, your mind, your business, your talents, your gifts, your money, your abilities, it all belongs to Him now and not you? Does anybody think that's reasonable? Would it be fair? Would it be right? If you were on your way to hell and your addiction and your everything and Jesus died for you and he shared the good news and you believed it, hallelujah, and you received that life, praise God, and so your old way is dead and you've been reborn in him, wouldn't it be reasonable to now offer yourself or present yourself back to him each day and say, Lord, this day belongs to you. My mind, my mouth, my will, my emotions, everything is now yours and no longer mine because it's not I that live, it's really you living in me Amen. got some new folks just new guys in here just staring at me clay this is a little deep <laughs> maybe i'll share it again like your seventh month this is a little tough this is serious i'm not playing games here man i'm talking about the truth of the gospel this is not some religious motion we're going through we're not just coming to church to get checked off by some angel and say, I win. I'm giving you the word of the living God that'll change your life forever. So praise God. This is what it means to be holy. Verse 19 says this. I put it in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. For just as you used to offer your parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, wickedness, now offer them as slave to slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. You used to offer your brain and your lungs and your lips and your dips and your stuff and your mind and your body and your stuff to wickedness. Now he's saying you're born again. Offer everything to righteousness for Christ. Offer it all to Him. Romans 12.1 I beseech you therefore, brethren. Forgive me, I learned it in King James 40 years ago. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, in light of what He's done for you, to present yourselves a living sacrifice. I urge you today, in thinking about what He's done for us, that He became sin, and he was beaten and died and buried for you. And then he rose to give you new life. If you've received that new life, then I urge you to present yourself, your whole self, all your abilities, talents that he gave you anyway. Lord God, I, I give it to you. I give my new life. It's all yours. I present myself to you for your glory. How do you want me to live? How do you want me to treat my wife? How do you want me to raise my kids? What church would you have me to go to Sunday? I'll obey you. What do you want me to read this week? Which television show would you like me to watch or not watch? Who do you want me to hang out with or not hang out with? What small group would you like me to get involved in that I can read and grow with my brothers? Lord, should I be involved and get plugged into church and learn and grow or should I... Want me to do this on my own? I'm telling you the answer already because I know. I've been walking with him for many years. I know he wants you plugged in. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together like the matter of some are in the habit of doing, but much more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10. Don't be in the habit of forsaking assembling together like some in your family and friends and relatives are involved in. Don't be like that. But get involved in a live group, in a small group, in a church that's doing something much more as you see the day, capitalize the day of his return. As you see it approaching, we need to be involved more, not less. Because things are getting shaky out there. And if I could prophesy to you, it's going to start shaking harder in the next few years. Yeah. You think they're shaking now? It's going to shake so much that the only thing left standing is those who are standing on the rock. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, and the shaking has already begun. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Things are shaken, and as things shake, nations are waking up and looking for the answer. And the harvest is taking place now. I'm prophesying to you. Receive it. 
Hallelujah. It's taking place right now. Present yourself as instruments of righteousness. This is your reasonable service in light of he, what he's done. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you can know his perfect will for your life. You can know his will, his ways. You can know him and you can walk with him. He's not a faraway God that we can't approach. No, through Christ we can walk with him. We've been reconciled as Christians to him. He lives in us. I'm challenging you to be aware of his presence each and every day and present yourself. Lord God, it's your life in me. I present myself to you. Live through me. Do you want me to help someone? you want me to bless someone? It's your life in me. Lord God, I'm looking around at these people right now while I'm praying with my eyes open. Hey, I do that sometimes. You can, don't bow your heads, don't close your eyes. Just look at me. I'm praying right now. What's well, prayer? I'm talking to God. Lord God, you see these folks and you heard this word that you gave me to give to them. Lord God, that we have, as Christians, we have died, we have been buried, we've been born again, raised with him. Now it's you that live, a, live in us. Lord, we present ourselves together right now as instruments of righteousness for you. Lord, we couldn't live by the law before, but praise God, now the righteousness requirements of the law is fulfilled in our daily life. It's because you're in us. Help us, Lord God, to reveal your glory to the world around us. In Jesus' mighty name, I love you all. Have a great day.